Entschuldigung. Ich glaube, wir möchten nochmal anfangen mit den nächsten drei Vorträgen. Und wir schauen uns jetzt äh, die Wirtschaft an. Ich fand, ich fand äh, die Frage zum, äh, oder dazu, was muss auf Herstellerebene oder auf Handelsebene passieren, das fand ich auch sehr relevant. Und ich möchte auch ähm, in dieser Runde bei, der, bei meiner Leitfragen bleiben, ein bisschen wie, wie können Vermeidung und Verpackungsalternative zum Geschäftsmodell werden? Ähm, welche Chancen bietet Vermeidung äh, der Industrie und dem Handel? Und welche Vor- und Nachteile ähm, sind das bei der Umstellung auf neue Verpackungsstrukturen? Und wir schauen uns die Praxis aus verschiedenen Sichtweisen an, mit drei verschiedenen Vorträgen. Einmal aus der Perspektive des Handels mit Catherine Conway, die Gründerin und Direktorin von Unpackaged Innovation UK. Einmal in der Logistik. Eva Leonhardt ist die stellvertretende Geschäftsführerin von der Stiftung Initiativ Mehrweg in Berlin. Und einmal aus der Industrie. Äh, Monique Klebsattel ist die Marketingdirektorin für EKW Deutschland, hier mit Sitz in Stuttgart. Ähm, Erstmal Catherine, vielen Dank, dass du da bist. Thank you, Emily. So it's only taken nearly a decade, but finally I'm in a room of people who understand what I'm talking about with zero waste. So, just to tell you about what I'm going to talk about today is the history of Unpackaged um, for the last nine years. Uh, why? Why we do it. Uh, the future of Unpackaged for me and the business. Um, and then really the challenges and opportunities that I see for everybody in the room. So back in 2005, I read this quote in The Guardian. Michael Paulwyn was the architect of the Eden Project, which is a very large-scale environmental project uh, in the UK. And I read this quote, and it just stuck in my head, which says, it's hard to visit a landfill site without being struck by the craziness of taking very valuable minerals and resources out of the ground, using loads of energy, turning them into short-life products, and then dumping them back in the ground. It's an absolutely monumental waste of energy and resources. And as someone from the fashion industry might say, it's just so last century. So this was going round in my head. I was just a normal person. I worked for a charity. I used to go to um, a health food shop to refill Ecova products because we have Ecova refills. And I would buy all of my dry goods and all of my cheese and everything. And then I'd come home and I'd put everything in jars and I'd throw the packaging straight away. And I thought, this is crazy. Why can't... I go to a whole shop where everything is refillable. And so just to make the point that the whole idea from the start with Unpackage was about refills. Setting up a bulk shop is easy. Anyone can set up a bulk shop. Anyone can open a big container of lentils and sell them out, and people just take paper bags. But if you do that, you haven't actually solved the problem. So what you have to try and set up is a refill shop where customers can bring their own containers to refill, and that's much, much harder because that's about behavior change. So in 2006, 2005, 2006, I was thinking of the idea and I spent a full year and I was trying to work out whether I should have a shop that people would come to and they would bring their containers or whether I'd have a delivery service and I would take it to people's houses because obviously London is very urban, it's very dense and people work very long hours so it's hard to have shops. Um, I thought and thought and thought, and then very, a, a friend of mine said, well, why don't you set up a market store? Why don't you see if someone will give you some funding and at least you can get out there and start talking to people? So that was the first market stall in 2006. Um, I think we were probably the most heavily branded market stall in history um, because it was really obvious from the start that we would need really, really strong branding and the message about bringing your own containers had to be right at the forefront um, because we weren't going to have any packaging. Um, so at that time, I didn't know that we were at the top of the waste hierarchy. There was no such thing as a zero waste movement. There was probably a little bit of circular economy thinking within big corporations, but there was really nothing around what we were doing. So I spent a year, ended up with two market stalls, um, and really just talked to people. And I used to sit there and think when I sold about three bottles of Ecova in a day, and it had cost me about five times that much to have the market stall, I would think maybe I'm just an art installation making people think about packaging. Maybe there isn't a business in here. Although nine years later, I'm still here. 
So after that, we opened the first shop in 2007. And really, it's because, A, we had two market stalls, and it was getting really heavy carrying all of these things. But then also, consumers were saying to us, well, why can't I buy olive oil? Why can't I buy all these different types of products, which we just couldn't sell on a market stall? And then also, if the market is only open on a Saturday, it's not much use to someone if they've run out of washing up liquid on a Monday, and then they have to wait for the rest of the week. So we opened the first shop in 2007 in this beautiful old dairy. It was very, very low budget to start off with, so everything was done with scoops. Um, and the process was that customers would come in, and I think in those days we didn't even have tear stickers. We had two or three different scales on the till, and the customer would come up, and we could only serve two or three customers at one time. Um, luckily, it was a very small shop, and we could just about manage it. But it was very, very basic. Um, but the idea was to sell everything that you would want from your local corner shop. So we sold milk in refills. We sold daily essentials like bread and eggs, um, fruit and vegetables, uh, toiletries, so shampoo, things like that, and then obviously all of the dry goods. So it was, it was super successful in the sense that we ended up with an insane amount of press. I mean, we really were just one very small shop in London, and we had people like CNN and BBC and everyone coming down. So it definitely captured people's imaginations. We ended up with a really, really loyal customer base, and we managed to sell over 700 products out of a 400-square-foot shop which is about the size of this. I mean, it was tiny, so we packed everything in. Uh, the, the challenges are that it was 2007, and it was the start of the global recession, which is a really bad time to set up a niche environmental business. Um, we also had problems with our landlord, so I had a restrictive lease, so there were certain products that I couldn't sell because he had a very cheap deli across the road and didn't want me to compete with him, which was a shame. Um, and London is a very, very expensive place to own a shop, um, let alone a niche environmental business. And to be honest, no one really knew what we were talking about. So there were some customers who would come and understood what we were doing. But really, we were in a very lonely position. But we learned a lot of things from the shop. So we learned about our consumers, and then we learned about the impact of why Unpackaged is important. So really, we had a, a ready-made customer base who would, this was the solution they were looking for. They had also been thinking the same thing. And I really do think that if you give customers the right options, they make the right decisions. It's just there aren't enough businesses offering decent uh, you know, environmental alternatives. So we did a survey, and our customers told us that really they were coming to us to refill. So we had an 87% 80, of our customers said that they always or nearly always bought their containers to refill. So I, I, I averaged that we had an 80% refill rate, which is really, really high. Um, but they didn't just want to refill. They actually wanted really high quality products as well. So all of our products were certified organic or artisan from local producers. And that was really, really important, um, as was the fact that we were an ethical business. So they wanted to spend money, if they could choose, with someone who was trying to do the right thing. So initially, um, the business was about packaging. It was really just about packaging reduction, but it became quite obvious that we had a lot of other impacts that were beyond packaging. So we commissioned a study um, which told us that there was an average 48% carbon emissions reduction every time a product was refilled and unpackaged. Um, for some products it was higher, so for olive oil I think it was a sort of 70% reduction because obviously the glass is very heavy. Other products it was lower, but it just shows the potential if you were to switch the grocery shopping to refilling. Um, we also had a lot less food waste, um, so the average um, uh, uh, family in England is throwing away about £500 worth of food a year, which is 8.3 million tonnes, which is 20 million tonnes of emissions. So we have a massive food waste issue in the UK, which I think is probably shared across um, Europe. Uh, reducing material waste for landfill, so we estimated that for an average basket of 10 products, so washing up liquid, muesli, things you would refill over a year, you would save 120 pieces of packaging. So recycling is great, but you're still using loads of energy and resources to recycle them, whereas if those is, are products that didn't need the packaging in the first place, then you might as well just not have it. 
But then the really important bit was the consumer behavior change. So 60% of our customers said that since they started shopping with us, they really thought about how their, pa their packaging um, came to them, that they threw away less rubbish, and they chose not to buy overpackaged goods in other shops. So it really showed that through the actual experience of refilling with us, it impacted on their behavior elsewhere. Also, over 80% of our customers said that since they started shopping with us, they actually felt good and that they were doing something to make change. And I think that positive reinforcement is really, really important um, for helping people feel. Everyone feels like they can't do anything and the environmental problems are too big. And actually helping them do something in which they feel like they're having a positive impact is really, really important. And then finally, there are actually loads of financial benefits across the supply chain. So your producer gets a bigger margin because they don't have to buy the packaging. The retailer gets a bigger margin, and then you can pass that cost saving onto the customer. Consumers save money, so they say that the average family is spending £470 a year on packaging alone, so they can obviously save money um, by not getting the packaging. And then communities benefit from local shops, so there's a lot of research in the UK that a pound spent in a local shop is worth something like £1.30 to a local community. If you spend it in a supermarket chain, it's only worth about 70-something P, so there's a real value to the community of supporting independent shops. So this was all in the first um, uh, five years of Unpackaged. And then we moved to our bad year. Um, so we, moved, we knew we needed to move to a bigger shop. Um, unfortunately, I chose to open a shop with a restaurant. So it was totally beautiful. And we fixed all of the problems that we had in the last shop. It was wonderful. Um, but unfortunately, I shouldn't have opened quite such a big restaurant. But I really thought we weren't making enough money in the, the other shop. And I thought we needed it as a revenue driver. Um, and I chose to go into business with the wrong person. So we struggled for a year, and then we ended up with a very, very big site, at which point I just had to close and do a, a wholesale rethink of, of where Unpackaged was going, which led to our supermarket collaboration. So when that shop shut, I had to really think about whether I wanted to open another shop, um, which, as everyone who owns one of these shops will tell you, is super, super hard work. Um, in the UK, the supermarkets, the main four supermarkets, account for 75% of sales. So all of the alternative things like farmers markets or fruit and veg box schemes really is a drop in the ocean compared to where the mainstream is shopping, which is big supermarkets. Um, and so what I thought, having done all that for sort of five or six years, I thought actually the, the time was ripe to really try and get into the mainstream and try and take this um, concept into a supermarket setting. But it needed to change quite a lot to make it work because small unpackaged shops are very uh, labor intensive. They all rely on the staff having to do a lot of work and supermarkets just don't work like that. So we, in February, um, opened a 12-month trial with Planet Organic, who are a chain of um, organic supermarkets in London. Um, I set up the, the concept. We developed a whole new scale. So you can see the scale on the right-hand side, developed with a German company as well, because the English companies just couldn't do it, and they were amazing. Um, and that's a whole self-service tear system, and I think it's the only one that exists in the world, which means that the customer can come in weigh their own containers, get a proper barcoded um, tear weight, which they can then go off and refill. They come back, they follow the instructions, and they just end up with a product in their basket with a barcode that they can check out at the end. So that was really, really crucial to making it work within a supermarket setting. Um, the successes and challenges, um, it's been really successful because they have scale. You know, I think we used to sell two kilos of mango in our shop a week, mango slices, which are so popular. Um, and they sell between 10 and 15 kilos. I mean, just the scale of the amount of customers they've got dwarfs what we could ever have done. But they're not as good as refilling because they shop in a whole shop full of packaging. So whereas with Unpackage, when somebody steps over the threshold, they buy into the concept that they're refilling, whereas in a supermarket full of packaging, it's not as obvious. So there's definitely a higher rate of paper bag use. But on balance, our impact is probably greater because we're serving more customers than we did before. So I just wanted to bring it back into why Unpackage is important in a, in a business context. Um, climate change, as everybody in this room knows, is a reality that businesses have to prepare for, and nobody's doing it. Um, so we are going to have climate change, we're going to have peak oil, which is obviously where all the packaging comes from, and we're going to have resource shortages. 
So the unpackaged model, by being at the top of the waste hierarchy, is the most sustainable. But also it's really, really good business because if people are locked into refilling with you, they're repeat customers. So they are coming back time and time again. And it's up to you to give them the right products and to keep increasing your product uh, base so that they keep buying more things off you. So in terms of the future of Unpackage, from the only person that was doing it, there is now the most amazing amount of shops all over Europe and the world who are also running unpackaged style shops. So I think this really shows that there's much more acceptance of environmental issues, there's more of a zero waste movement, and that's why I'm so pleased to come here and meet everyone and do the workshop tomorrow, because actually I think a lot of people like to put out press releases saying they're the first unpackage this and the first zero waste that. Actually, it would benefit everybody for everybody to say we're part of a movement. And the more we can do to create the network and movements, the more the big supermarkets can't write us off as just you know a bunch of hippies with their little shops. Um, so in terms of what um, Unpackage and I'm working on, um, we're really sort of expanding it out beyond just retail and working on unpackaged solutions throughout the supply chain. So currently with the fish industry, with um, the beer industry, so really looking at how to bring reuse um, and that behaviour change up the supply chain and not just down with retail and then hopefully carrying on with the retail project as well. So a few little thoughts about the challenges and opportunities. Um, I mean, as a consumer, it's actually pretty easy now to live a zero waste lifestyle. There are a million blogs on the internet that will tell you how to do everything from making your own soap to this, that and the other. It's just really about commitment. I would imagine you could refill everything you wanted to from a variety of shops here in Berlin, but you just have to have the time and the willingness to do it, and the willingness to just say no to, to the packaging. I mean, Bea Johnson will tell you all the things she says no to in her book. Um, for retailers and wholesalers, I think the question is, is how big, how big is your vision? You know, any product can be sold without packaging. It's just about getting the right systems, the right dispensers. We were talking about the packaging industry. And actually, in the UK, the packaging industry are dinosaurs, and they whine about why nobody understands the value that they put and, and why if you shrink rack up a cucumber, it lasts for three days longer, and everyone should be really grateful. And what they don't seem to understand is there's lots of people, like young product designers, who are coming up through their industry, who learn all about environmental issues at college. And they used to phone me up, and they used to say, oh, I'm designing a yogurt dispenser. Can I come and trial it at the store? And the packaging industry doesn't seem to understand that it just needs to change. You can still create packaging. It's just reusable packaging. It's new reusable systems. You can still have design and innovation and marketing differentiation and all the things that's really important to them. It's just a shift. And also their consumers, you know, talking about education in school, the consumers of tomorrow are going to demand environmental packaging. You know, it's just not going to be enough to give them um, single-use disposable packaging. Um, so government... Um, I think the opportunities for local government are really obvious because obviously if you don't have to do loads of recycling, you can save a lot of money on um, your logistics and, and your costs. The challenge for central government is really how to create legislation that will support environmentally friendly businesses. There was nothing about how I ran my business that gave me any form of tax incentive, tax break, nothing. In fact, everything just cost me money because I paid my staff properly, my energy was from renewable sources, so th there's really no incentive for businesses to do things in an environmentally positive way, but governments can actually change that. I think the problem with the UK is, is that the government hates legislation, so I kind of think that Europe has more chance in doing it, although listening to this, then maybe not. Um, but I think a real problem in the UK certainly is the waste industry. The waste industry, the anaerobic digestion industry, they all make loads of money out of waste, so they actually lobby against anything that that really is pushing things up the, the waste hierarchy because they want their waste and they want to make money off it. So there's actually a, a real play with that. So I just wanted to finish with the other quote that um, uh, inspired Unpackaged, um, Buckminster Fuller, who was a total genius. Um, and this really was the other one that has always been in my head um, since I set it up, which you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And my vision is still that the unpackaged model will make traditional grocery shopping obsolete.